So this, uh, this begins our third session of the day, uh, Literature 2, so our second literature uh, session in the conference. And our first speaker is David Miano. Uh, David Miano, is that correct? Miano, that's correct. Okay, great. I just want to double check. Uh, David Miano is an ancient historian specializing in the histories of the Near East, Egypt, Greece, Rome, India, and China. He earned his PhD at the University of California, San Diego. He is the author of Shadow on the Steps, Time Measurement in Ancient Israel, Geared Towards Scholars, How to Know Stuff, a little ebook designed for the general public, and several anthologies designed for classroom use, including Ideas in the Making, a source book for world intellectual history to 1300, and Pen, Stylus, and Chisel, an ancient Egyptian source book. He currently teaches at the Academy of Classical Arts and Humanities in Sarasota, Florida. Previously, he taught at the University of California, San Diego, and at San Diego Mesa College. 2009, he received the uh, Ravel College Outstanding Faculty Award in recognition of his excellence in teaching, and he continues his efforts to improve. Additionally, he is the founder and executive director of Scala Antiquorum, a national nonprofit academic society dedicated to the study of ancient history. So, Dr. Miano. Um, oh, he will uh, be presenting a talk titled, Who Wrote the Tell Dan Inscription? Dr. Miano, I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, a quick technical question. Is there a way I can start the slideshow without taking up my whole screen because I have to see my notes as well? That I honestly don't know. Um, it does presenter view on I Zoom. have it on presenter view, but when I hit a uh, slideshow, it fills the entire screen. <laughs> so I don't know how to uh, minimize it without just escaping from it. I have never dealt with that before. Uh, David or Megan, have you ever dealt with this issue before? Yes, no, there's only... There's a way to um, adjust how the sh screen share goes. If you go into in the PowerPoint towards the top uh, in the screen share area, there's settings somewhere, and you can adjust them to what you can show. And if you go into window view or something like that, it'll be able that you'll be able to share only the PowerPoint window, and it won't take up the full screen. Okay, <laughs> where is that? Um, uh, it's not monitor, primary monitor. That's not it, right? Um, ooh, uh, I hate to just take up this time. Oh, customs. No, no, I don't see that. Um, hmm. Well, uh, and I don't want to keep everyone waiting. So, uh, could I just use the, um, keep it in the work mode? I mean, or I could do it without the slides. It is possible too. I think work mode is, is perfectly fine. It will, it will show your notes as well so you can see them. Um, we're not pressed for time. If you want to take a second oh, to, oh, okay. to work it out, that's that's perfectly all right. I, okay. I'm sure our, our audience will um, you know, show a bit of forbearance while we... Okay. So could out. you say again where that was, where uh, I would adjust this? Yeah, I'm looking right now under the slideshow tab in PowerPoint. Okay. Um, and then if you click on, um, what was that? Set up slideshow. Set up slideshow. Hmm. Oh yeah, there it is. Okay. Ah, okay. And then the second option on the left show type browse by an individual window, I think is the one that you're looking for. All righty. And then if you hit, um, play slides, uh, to play the slides, it'll show up only in a window. And now when you share your screen, you can share only that window of PowerPoint. Oh, yes. All right, thank you so much. Okay, so okay. now share screen, PowerPoint slideshow. How does that look? Is that working? That looks great. Yeah, it's working perfectly. All right, thank you for your patience, everybody. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna share uh, presentation on uh, the Tel Dan inscription, as if there hasn't been enough written about this already, right? Uh, on July 21st, 1993, at Tel Dan, archaeological surveyors discovered a fragment of an inscribed, inscribed uh, basalt stone. The language of the inscription was recognized as early Aramaic, with close affinities to Hebrew and Moabite, and it immediately gained notoriety because of the phrase House of David found written on it. The slab appeared to be part of a stela that had been erected in ancient times, but was later smashed and used as part of a wall 
in a large piazza at the entrance to the city's outer gate. On June 20th, 1994, another smaller fragment was found approximately two meters from the original location of the first, and 10 days later, there was a third. The latter two fragments can be joined in an obvious manner, and Avraham Biran and Joseph Nava, the publishers of the inscription, have attached them to the first fragment so as to produce a fairly coherent continuous text. And uh, my second slide, I can show you the three parts together. So uh, this hasn't really been questioned by uh, most scholars. They think that this is a sound reconstruction for the most part. Uh, and so we're gonna proceed uh, under that assumption. Since the discovery of these last two pieces, dating the inscription has been relatively easy. It mentions the deaths of uh, King Jehoram of Israel and uh, King Ahaziah of Judah, events that the Bible describes in conjunction with the coup d'etat of Jehu the Israelite. This makes it probable that the text was composed in the lifetime of one of Jehu's contemporaries. This would be the ninth century BCE. Ascertaining authorship, though, has proved more difficult since the beginning of the inscription in which the writer would have identified himself is missing. The chief reasons for ascribing authorship of the inscription to a king of Aram are two. One, the language of the text is Aramaic. And uh, second, the inscription includes references to the Aramean god Hadad. Authorship is most commonly attributed to Hazael, who usurped the throne of Aram from his predecessor Hadad Idri sometime prior to the coup of Jehu. But the location of the stela in a territory not known to be under Aramean hegemony at the time of its creation is strange and deserves some scrutiny. Is the twofold support for Aramean authorship as strong as is usually supposed? Well, we can't dismiss the fact that the inscription was found in an Israelite city, strategically crucial to the security of Israel's northern border, and one of its two primary religious centers. Biran and Nava, without delving too deeply into the matter, suggested that the writer of the inscription must have temporarily conquered Dan and erected the stela when the town was under his control. Yet evidence to support that conclusion is lacking. They draw attention to 2 Kings chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, which speaks of Hazael striking the Israelites on all the borders of Israel. They admit however, that the text mentions only the territories east of the Jordan River. K.L. Knoll asserts that Dan was taken by the Arameans as far back as the reign of Asa, citing 1 Kings 15.20. However, the biblical text makes no mention of the capture of Dan or of any other cities. Ben-Hadad, at Asa's instigation, merely struck key fortifications on Israel's northern border to provide Asa with the diversion he needed to take Ramah in the south. If we are going to use the Bible as a source of evidence for who controlled the city in the time of Jehu, we are led rather in the other direction. The passage in 2 Kings 10.29 seems to indicate that during Jehu's reign, Israel was in possession of Dan. To be sure, these observations do not prove that the Arameans never occupied Dan, either in Hazael's time or in any other period, but they do demonstrate that concrete evidence for Aramean occupation, apart from hypotheses based on the inscription itself, does not exist. Moreover, the absence of a mention of Dan or its territory in 2 Kings 10, 32 and 33 is noteworthy. It would appear that the stela was erected in an Israelite town during a period in which Israelites had control over it. The presence of the inscription in the Israelite stronghold of Dan can be explained in either of two ways. One, the Arameans temporarily captured and occupied Dan, during which time they erected the stela. Or two, an Israelite king wrote an inscription in Aramaic. Each of these explanations has its problems. Up to this point, however, the first has almost been universally accepted, with little or no attention given to the alternative. To my knowledge, only Jan Veselius has entertained the possibility, the possibility that an Israelite wrote the inscription. Although there are weaknesses in his argument, his basic, basic thesis has much to commend it. 
The fact that the Teldan inscription is written in Aramaic does not necessitate the conclusion that the author was a king of Aram. It signifies only that the inscription was put up in an area where Aramaic was commonly spoken. Israel was Aram's immediate neighbor to the south, and Dan was situated very close to the border, if the concept of border is not anachronistic. Such proximity to Aram must have had some influence on northern Israel. Language and dialects are no respecters of national boundaries. We expect in both the ancient and modern worlds, a gradual shift in language between areas with very fuzzy borders where bilingualism is the rule and mixed dialects may arise. The city of Dan likely had many Aramaic speakers and perhaps Aramaic was indeed the dominant language there. Even if Israel held the city, it would make more sense for a king to put up a monument in the local language, lest none of the literate people there could read it. That states possess official languages in which all their administrative documents, correspondences, and monuments are written is a modern notion which should not be imposed upon our understanding of ancient societies. We should set aside the equations Aramaic equals Aram and Hebrew equals Israel as too simplistic. The second support for attribution of authorship to an Aramean king is the reference to Hadad sometimes considered the patron god of the Arameans. I'm gonna go on to the next slide here. Oh, there's a close up of the text and we can come back to that, but I wanna look at one particular clause here and that's this one. So this is the, the phrase with Hadad. The statement, Hadad made me king and Hadad went before me seems to indicate that the main that the man speaking is an Aramean, or at least a worshiper of Hadad. I'm not gonna entertain the notion that the king of Israel at the time would have paid homage to Hadad. Granted, Shalmaneser III himself dedicated an inscription to Hadad of Kerbail, which coincidentally happens to mention Jehu of Israel's submission to Assyria in the same context, but it seems unlikely that Jehu would have dedicated anything to Hadad. In subsequent years, who was recognized most for his attack on the Baal cult in Israel. There's no reason to doubt that this is an accurate historical recollection, since we know he broke with the policies of the previous dynasty, a dynasty that promoted Baal worship. The Baal of these narratives can confidently be equated with Hadad, since the Mount Carmel episode clearly describes Baal as a storm god. Furthermore, if the kingdom of Aram was a sworn enemy of Israel, during Jehu's reign, as appears to be the case, then it does not seem possible that Jehu would honor the national god of his foes. Jehu, as enemy of Aram and the house of Ahab, would not have portrayed Baal Hadad in a positive light. Instead, I think we need to ask whether we're interpreting this portion of the inscription correctly. There are two missing letters at the end of line four that are crucial to our understanding of the clause. Biran and Nava's reconstruction, uh, which I will show you right now, uh, of adding the direct object marker uh, plus the first person singular object suffix may be incorrect. They themselves admit that the phrase is rather awkward. Me, me. According to them, the first person singular personal pronoun at the beginning of line five was added for emphasis. However, even if the Aleph on line four is part of the direct object marker, the actual object of the first verb is not preserved. One also wonders whether Aleph Nun He at the beginning of the next line should be considered a complete word. Baruch Halpern suggested that Aleph Nun He may represent the end of a longer word, such as a verb ending Aleph with a third person masculine singular object suff suffix after the energic noon. Such a construction is less clumsy than that proposed by Biran and Nava. The verb Halpern offered as a possibility was maha. At the time he wrote the article, Halpern was aware only of the first fragment's existence, but the discovery of the other two fragments comports with his theory. So let me show you his reconstruct or my reconstruction using his suggestion here. So the verb, the first verb, 
can be taken as an H stem passive. And Hadad was made king. I struck him. Alternatively, we might consider Hadad to be used as a casus pendens, and uh, the verb is taking its subject from the sentence before. We would then have the reading, and he was made king. As for Hadad, I struck him. F.H. Cryer has posited that Hadad does not refer to the god Hadad, but to a king of Damascus, and has reconstructed the first two words as um, King Hadad, but there's no reason to believe that in Aramaic there would be a definite article uh, preceding Malak, so uh, I do not go with that one. But it still is possible that Hadad is a hypocoristicon, and the referent is not a deity. Since the writer speaks of his interaction with Hadad before he does his usurpation of the throne of Israel, the Hadad to which he refers may be Hadad Idri of Damascus, the Ben Hadad of 1 Kings 20, and the immediate predecessor of Hazael. The following clause is fully preserved, and interpreters have noted that similar expressions have been used to refer to a god ensuring victory in battle. Hadad walked before me is what I'm talking about. Uh, by far, the most common usage, though, in Hebrew, is used in connection with service to the deity. And the Akkadian parallels, ina pani alaku, or atalaku, and ina machria italak, are formulation used formulations used in royal grants to refer to a vassal service to his Assyrian overlord. We may wonder then if the framer of the inscription, rather than noting the protection and support of Hadad, is asserting his superiority over Hadad, whom we could interpret to be either the god of his enemies, the territory of that god, or the enemy king himself. I therefore propose that we fully investigate the possibility that an Israelite king framed the inscription. Giovanni Garbini has made the following appropriate observation about the contents of the text. Quote, it's difficult to negate the discomfort one feels in regard to an Aramaic inscription, which instead of giving news about Arameans, talks widely of Hebrews. In the Aramaic context, there is only mention of Hadad, the well-known head of the Aramaic pantheon. While on the other hand, we find the, the name of Israel three times and once the expression, House of David, unquote. If the writer was indeed an Israelite, his identity is not difficult to determine. I'm going to go to uh, the next slide here uh, with my uh, translation. The authors claim, I killed Joram, the son of Ahab, the king of Israel, and I killed Ahaziah, the son of Joram, the king of the house of David, points directly to Jehu. The biblical account relating to these events, which was written two or three centuries later, not very distant, relatively speaking, reads thus, Jehu took a bow in his hand and shot Jehoram between the arms. So the arrow came out his heart and he collapsed in his war chariot. Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw it and took to flight by the way of the garden house. Jehu went in pursuit of him and said, him also strike him down. So they struck him down while in the chariot on the way up to Gur, which is near Ibleam, but he continued his flight to Megiddo and died there. Several correlations exist between the words on the stela and those in 2 Kings. For example, there is the unusual statement on line six, I slew 70 kings who harnessed thousands of chariots and thousands of horses. Many have found this boast puzzling as it lies near the beginning of the inscription and thus among the early achievements of the author. It seems hardly conceivable, note Biran and Nava, that a king in the early years of his reign would declare that he had defeated so many kings. They go on to suggest that this statement is merely a summary of his accomplishments placed at the beginning, and the details were probably recorded further on. But there surely were not 70 kings in the vicinity for such a person to defeat, even in a lifetime. Some have attempted to alleviate the difficulty by calling the ayin into question and uh, reading it as other words. But Malak, like Sharu, can sometimes refer to lesser rulers, princes, or chieftains. If we understand the author to be Jehu, the statement makes a little more sense. 2 Kings 10, 1 through 11, relates how Jehu did away with the 70 sons of Ahab, all of whom were possible contenders for the throne. Could these not be the 70 kings referred to in the inscription? 
Although the figure may be a round number in both instances, both the Tel Den inscription and the biblical record may reflect an actual military undertaking at the time of Jehu's coup. He himself is, he himself is quoted at 2 Kings 10.2 as saying that these 70 princes had war chariots, horses, a fortified city, and armor at their disposal, which is in keeping with the description on the stela. The preceding clause is difficult to decipher as there are missing letters. It begins, I departed from, and the next word is probably seven or 70. A word divider likely follows, and there's space for one more word made up of three unknown letters and a yod. However, the final word is easily recognizable as my king. So there's evidence that the speaker was at one time in the service of a king and not of royal blood himself. Such a translation has been questioned because it is difficult to understand the expression in an Aramean context. Other acceptable translations have been proposed like my reign, my kingdom, my enemy or vassal kings. Uh, Barana Nava offered the following as a possible rendering of the phrase. And I went forth to war outside of the seven districts of my kingdom. They were not able to offer, however, a word for districts that would fit. It seems best not to force the expression, but to take the word at face value, my king. We have a basis, therefore, for seeing the writer of the inscription as a formal, former vassal or servant of a king. Perhaps he was a military commander. Here again, there's a link with Jehu, who served precisely in that capacity. Uh, the inscription refers to the author's father, whose identity is probably to be sought in the words immediately prior to my father in line two. By means of computer analysis, Schneiderwind and Zuckerman have demonstrated that the letter preceding is almost certainly a Lamed, and the letter before that an Aleph or Dalit, but more probably an Aleph. The letter preceding that one can be a Samak, Resh, or Kof, taking into account its long vertical tail, but that's where the speculation begins. They posit the name Barakel, but we know of no such person in this context. Since the name Israel appears already in the inscription and the letters fit in this case, it seems safer to assume that that's what, he's, what we have here. The author may be making claim to the throne of Israel by identifying a previous king as his father, his ancestor. For convenience, I've provided my uh, full transcriptions translation there in its entirety. Obviously my reconstruction is tentative and open to revision, but it gives the reader a general impression of how the text might be interpreted based on my arguments here. So according to my line of reasoning, I posit that Jehu erected a stela in Dan not long after his successful coup as propaganda designed to reinforce his claim to sovereignty over Israel. Dan was a major Israelite city and religious center, and it wouldn't be surprising if Jehu erected a stela in so prominent a location. The monument would have served as a deterrent to the neighboring Arameans in case they ever entertained the idea of extending their southern border. Perhaps for that very reason, it was composed in Aramaic. On the other hand, the new king may have commissioned a Aramaic scribe. It's maybe a, a little too early for that, but um, within the next century, Aramaic scribes will be quite common. The stela was probably destroyed by the usurpers Shalom or Menachem when the Jehu dynasty was brought down. And now I can open things up for questions. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Miano. This really I wasn't even looking. I, was my chin cut off the entire time? Sorry about that. It wasn't the entire time. <laughs> okay. You moved around a bit, you know, as, right. as you tend to do. Uh, there is one question here uh, from the YouTube chat. Uh, okay. can, uses, can usage of Aramaic have its reason in the fact that Aramaic was sort of an international language there? Well, it's a little bit early in time for that. I did actually have a section of my paper that tried to argue that it was coming into currency already, but really it's a, that was, I thought, the weakest part of my argument and I dispensed with it because I'm about a century early, um, maybe 50 years. It's close, but I don't know if it's close enough. It's possible that that was already starting to occur, but I don't think there's quite enough evidence for it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, it was a really interesting talk. I think we'll probably um, uh, move on to the next presenter.